At the start of the day, you need to set your mind. When you get out of bed, Father, thank you for the gift of this day. It's another day you've made. I'm going to choose to be happy. I'm going to see the best. I'm going to be a blessing to others. I'm going to live this day to the full. If you don't set your mind, the enemy will set it for you. You'll wake up, think about all your problems, everything you've done wrong. I'll never break this addiction. I should have eaten better yesterday. I can't believe that coworker was rude to me. Don't start the day off negative. Don't bring yesterday's trouble, yesterday's disappointment, yesterday's failures into today. Start the day afresh and anew. The psalmist said, God's mercies are new every morning. Not every afternoon, not every evening. Each morning, receive the new mercy. How you start the day many times will determine what kind of day it's going to be. Don't ever start the day in neutral. Don't wait to see what kind of day it's going to be. Determine what kind of day it's going to be. Make up your mind, this is going to be a great day. I'm going to be productive today. I'm going to enjoy my family. I'm going to honor God. I'm grateful to be alive. That's setting your mind. That's making plans for a blessed day. Goes on to say, keep it set. That implies things are going to happen that will try to unset it. Challenges, delays, people that are rude, doors that close. You can't stop that from happening, but you can choose to not let it get on the inside. When worry comes, no, my mind is set. God is still on the throne. He's in control of my life. When offense comes, you can get upset, live bitter. No, God is my vindicator. He's fighting my battles. Contract didn't go through. You didn't get the position. You could be down, disappointed, but your mind is set. God, I trust you. I know you wouldn't have closed this door unless you had something better in store. Don't let the challenges during the day unset your mind. Keep it set. Keep it stayed on Him. Keep it full of praise. Keep expecting good things. Keep believing for what God promised you. You know, we don't make enough decisions for ourselves. To be honest, we let the devil make too many of them. He comes and whispers in your ear very early in the morning, this is going to be a lousy day. You feel bad. You this, that. Reminds you of all your problems. But you can say, no, I've decided that I, this is going to be a good day. I've decided that I'm going to enjoy everything, no matter what. And every day, say, God, I believe that you're going to take care of this. Let your attitude be, if anything good can happen today, it will, and it will happen to me. Let's make a decision today and ask God to help us to be positive to talk positive. Not, don't ignore your problems, but you can even find a positive way to talk about your problems. Yeah, I've got a big problem, but I've got a big God. You wake up in the morning, thoughts sometimes whisper, it's going to be a lousy day. I have so many problems. I don't feel like dealing with these children. You can either dwell on that, believe that it's true. And you'll go around discouraged. It'll become a reality. You'll have a lousy day. But a better approach is to say, no, thanks. I'm not going to dwell on those discouraging thoughts. They came to my mind, but I know I control the doorway. I don't have to allow them in. I'm going to erase them and replace them with some better thoughts. This is going to be a great day. Father, thank you that I'm alive. Thank you that you woke me up this morning. Thank you that I'm healthy. Thank you that you have a bright future in store for me. Like when you wake up in the morning, are your thoughts more characterized by, by worry or, or, or panic or overwhelm or fear or more by peace and calm? When, when you wake up, does your mind start, start kind of racing like about, you know, what's going to go wrong today? I'm worried about my kids. I, I'm worried about the, the state of our nation. Our, our country's out of control. Is your default thinking more worried thoughts or peaceful ones? In other words, even if it's a tough season, do you actually find yourself, no, no, I, I got it. I can cast my cares upon God today. I can sense the Holy Spirit, which transcends human understanding. Even if life is hard and complex right now, I still sense God's goodness. I sense his presence, his spirit with me. Do your thoughts drift towards the negative or the positive? Do you wake up and find yourself just kind of like negative, critical of people? I'm going to be working with her today and who does she think she is? 
uh, kind of assuming the worst instead of believing the best? Do you look at your day and you say, man, it's, it, it's, it's 7 a.m. and I'm already behind. There's not enough me to go around, okay? My family isn't going to help. My spouse, I, and, and, and I can't wait for this day to be over. And you're like, it's 7.15. Or do you wake up with positive faith? Again, even if the day is, is loaded, you'd say, no, no, I know Christ is with me. Even when I feel weak, he's strong and he's going to carry me and help me overcome today. Even the hard stuff, I know God's working all things together for my good because I love him and God loves me. Where you actually enter the day with a sense of like, man, God's given me this, this amazing life to steward and he's blessed me with some, some incredible spiritual gifts to use. And so I don't want to waste a moment today. I want, to, I want to invest myself in things that matter and I want to make a difference in the lives of people, especially the, those who are lost or, or lost in the world. So, so when everything else falls away from my life on earth, it's going to count for eternity. I want you to listen to me. What you think about on a daily basis matters more than you can imagine. This is the key. He wants us to make a decision every day to enjoy our life. Said another way, it is ultimately up to us if we're going to enjoy life. Even in the face of all that we're going through, and I know so many of you are going through difficult times right now, even in the face of the busyness of life, He wants us to have joy in our lives. He wants us to enjoy our life, not dread life, not just get by in life, not just endure life, not to be stressed out all the time, but to enjoy our life. Jesus said it like this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life, listen to this, that they might have and enjoy life in abundance, life to the full, life till it overflows. Think about it. Jesus came, came so that we could have and enjoy abundant life. The psalmist said this, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. God wants us to rejoice and have joy and enjoy every day that he gives us. Instead of waking up and saying, oh, I dread the day, I dread the day. We need to wake up and think, I can't hardly wait to see what God does today. Amen. God wants me to have joy. He wants my joy to be full. He doesn't want me crying all day out of depression, sadness or sorrow. He wants me celebrating all day because he wants my joy to be made full. If you want to enjoy life, you got to let God be God. And that means believe the word, get up every day and do the best you can and know that God understands and sees your heart. And if you love him, just love God and let him love you. When you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you think about? You plan the day or you, the day's already planned. Do you stop to listen to him? Lord, speak to my heart about today. What have you got in mind for today? What's your plan? We enjoy life more when we invite God into our everyday life. Sometimes it's so easy to, to divide our life up into sacred and secular. We fit God into a box of a Sunday morning church service and maybe a few minutes every morning when we have our quiet time. And then the rest of the time, the rest of our life, it's like we leave God out. But God doesn't want to be put into a box. He wants to be involved in every part of our everyday life. Listen to what the scripture says in Romans 12. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, go to, going to work life, and place it before God as an offering. Paul tells us in Colossians, let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. I would encourage you to let God into your everyday life. Let him into every detail of your life. We need to invite him into our parenting, invite him into our marriages, invite him into our work, invite him into, to, to go to the grocery store with us, invite him into our car as we face traffic, invite him into every aspect of our life, and then do everything we do as unto him. Do everything we do to please him. Ask him for his help as we go through our day. You see, friends, when we start inviting God into every aspect of our life, we find joy in the most common and ordinary parts of our lives. We enjoy life more. Every day, 
the priority of our life ought to be time we spend alone with Him, being quiet. And a good time to do that's when you start the day out. You cannot go in to work, wherever you work, forgetting God. Get to the place in your life where you feel like you've been robbed if you don't have quality time with the Lord. I like to do it when I first get up. Get up in the morning and just begin to praise God. Just lift your hands and say, Father, I just want to praise you today. And I just want you to know how wonderful it is to be able to be in your presence again today. And I want to give you praise and thanksgiving for all the wonderful things that you've already done for me, all the dreams that you've already brought to pass in my life. And I want to thank you in advance for bringing the dream to pass that I'm believing for right now. And I'm delighting myself in you. I count it a great joy and a great honor to spend quality time with you. Spending time with God means thanking Him continually. Amen. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, God says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. And He says, in everything give thanks. Why should I give thanks in everything? Because in everything, God's going to provide. One thing I found is that we enjoy life more when we're grateful. We enjoy life uh, when we recognize God's blessings in our lives and are grateful for them. The Bible says every good gift, every gift that we receive, everything that's good in our lives is from our Father in heaven. I have found the more grateful I am, the more I enjoy my life. You see, friends, gratitude and enjoying life go hand in hand. The more we recognize and are grateful for God's blessings in our lives, the more we enjoy our life. We enjoy life more when we focus on the positive, when we see the good in every situation, when we see the glass half full instead of half empty, when we stop looking at what's wrong in our lives and see what's right in our lives. Gratitude. Gratitude will change your view of your world. Are you practicing gratitude? Are you practicing gratitude? Be grateful in all circumstances. Let me tell you the most powerful time where you can be grateful. When nothing in your circumstances tell you that you should be grateful. Because that's the time you get to be grateful for what's eternal. Life at its best is a life that listens to God, trusts God, obeys God, and thanks God. That's life at its best. Two words, two words that, that I believe have the power to transform your life, transform your health, transform your happiness, transform your success, transform your relationship with other people and your walk with God. And they're really, they're just two real simple words. The words, thank you. And I want to tell you here today that there is power in gratitude. When the alarm clock rings tomorrow morning, what's your attitude? I've made it a point on purpose every time I hear the alarm clock to thank God. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. Say that with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be made glad in it. Rejoicing is something that you do because you choose to. It has nothing to do with your circumstance. It has nothing to do with the details of your situation. It has everything to do with your attitude, and that's determined by the amount of gratitude you have. Tomorrow when you get in your car and you drive to work, as you're fighting through traffic to get to the office, are you going to thank God for the job that you have? Only a fraction of the human population ever truly thanks God personally. Only a fraction of the human population ever truly lives a life of gratitude. Uh, it's so easy to start with a complaining attitude. It's so easy to roll out of bed and start seeing the glasses half empty. What isn't that should be? What's lost that should, that I should have? And so on and so on. And it's just a pattern of thinking. Gratitude is a constant mindset of thankfulness. It's more than just saying thank you every once in a while to God or to people. It's an attitude of gratitude that you make as your lifestyle. Thankfulness is a decision. Thankfulness is a decision. 
Am I choosing thankfulness over complaining moment by moment? We all woke up today, but how many of us thanked God for it? Let's take an assessment of our prayer life for a second. What percentage of my prayers are complaints? How much of my time speaking to God is offering thanksgiving out of a heart of gratitude or complaining out of a heart of bitterness and insecurity? We should be grateful to Jesus for everything because we don't deserve anything. Start your prayer time with the spirit of thanksgiving. Do it every day, giving thanks to God. Lord, thank you for a day of life on planet earth. Thank you, I can live and breathe and have my being today. I know it's a gift of mercy and I don't know how many days I have, but I know this is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad. Thank you, I have food in my belly, clothes on my back, a house to sleep in and not a cardboard box. I have transportation, I've got a good family, I've got great friends, I've got a great God to celebrate and honor. I thank you for allowing me to have another day on this great planet. Do that every day, approach him. He said, come before his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Hey, this is the greatest day of your life. Well, how can you say that, Rick? Well, because it's the only day you've got. Yesterday's gone forever, and you can't guarantee you're gonna be here tomorrow. What is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a moment, and it's gone. Boast not of tomorrow, for you don't know what a day may bring forth. So every day the sun comes up, you need to try to find something good about that day, because your life is lived one 24-hour span at a time. Say, Lord, I thank you that you understand the trial I'm going through, even though I don't have a clue. And when you cry, maybe in some personal Gethsemane, when your tears run down your cheek and soak a pillow at night, you say, Lord, I'm in the darkest valley I've ever known, but I know you're right beside me. I don't know what you're trying to show me, but I refuse to become bitter. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to become bitter or resentful. Yet will I praise you, the glory and lifter of my head, knowing that you're leading me to the greatest victory I've ever seen in all my life. I bless you and I praise you. And suddenly God turns things around and it starts falling into place because the spirit of thanksgiving has shattered your enemies by the invisible hand of God and everything starts to work out. Today, look around. Surely there are small blessings, little joys, tiny hints of God's favor for which you can be grateful. Don't take things for granted today. Take them with gratitude. A grateful heart is the treasure of God. What's the only thing you can give him that he didn't already have? A grateful heart. A grateful heart. He don't need your money. He don't need, he don't need you to work for him. Every moment in your life from the moment you wake up till the moment you lay your head on a pillow at night and all during the night, you have much to be thankful for. God is attracted to a grateful heart. An attitude of gratitude brings both his presence and his blessings. God is attracted to grateful hearts. Consider this, and I bet it's a verse that you know. Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving or gratitude and his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Through thanksgiving, we enter into his gates. So every time you pray, Start with thanksgiving. Every single prayer you pray, start with thanksgiving. Every single day, start with thanksgiving because that's how we enter into the presence of God. Gratitude is a daily choice. We should be thankful unto Him and we should bless His name. Every day, we should be thankful for the joy of our salvation because He has taken His blood and He has washed us white as snow because He has forgiven us and set us free. Every morning when you see the sun rise, you should be thankful unto Him and bless His name for His mercies have been renewed like the morning. Every time you recognize His faithfulness in your past, in your present, and 
promised in your future. You should be thankful unto him and bless his name. Every time you have an imperfect day and you're not the best that you could be and you recognize that his grace is greater than all of your sin and sufficient to cover all of your imperfections, you should be thankful unto him and bless his name. Every time he provides for you, every time he heals you, every time he protects you, every time he visits with you, you should be thankful unto him and bless his name. When you consider the power that you possess through the authority of his word, you should be thankful unto him and bless his name. When you know that he inhabits the praises of his people and where two or three of us have gathered, he has promised to be there in our midst. You should be thankful unto him and bless his name. Church, the Lord is in this place right now. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. It says that Jesus got up even before the sun rose and prayed. But there is something to be said about starting your day with prayer. There's something to be said about praying in the morning to gather your thoughts and to get your heart in the right place. Whatever you're facing, you need God's strength and it comes through prayer. Prayer is not informing God about anything. It's inviting God into everything. Get up every morning, drop down on your knees by the side of your bed right away and just say, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Help me today behave the way you want me to behave. You know, you work for God. You're on His payroll. If you go out and do what you're supposed to every day, you'll get your paycheck. God will take care of you. Come on, I'm talking to you. God will take care of you. We all work for God. You know, Diedrich Bonhoeffer said that when it comes to our days, we should be silent at the beginning of the day because God should have the first word. How, how might our mindset change? How might we begin to handle our distractions differently if, if we embraced this kind of practice? Just a few moments of your day, five minutes of just, God, I'm going to be with you. God, I'm going to sit here with you. Would you move inside of me? It's just a moment for you to be and to be with God. You ought to get up in the morning and say, God, I want to know you and love you more. I have done this every single morning of my life for decades. I don't get out of bed in the morning before I do this. I sit on the edge of my bed before my feet touch the ground and I, I, I just say this, dear God, it's another day. And if I don't get anything else done today, I want to know you a little bit better and I want to love you a little bit more. And if at the end of the day that life sucked, that day sucked, everything went wrong, it was terrible. I sinned, there were mistakes, there were all kinds of grief and problems and difficulties. If at the end of the day, I know God a little bit better and love him a little bit more, I didn't waste that day. On the other hand, it doesn't matter how many things you accomplish, how many things you achieve, how famous you become, how much money you make, if at the end of each day, you don't know God a little bit better and love him a little bit more, you just wasted that day. Because God did not create you and put you on earth just to mark things off your to-do list. In the morning, before you go anywhere, you get up and you make a decision. I belong to God, I don't belong to myself. And when I go out, when I go out of this bedroom, I start dealing with my family. When I go out the front door and I start dealing with society, I am a personal representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I need to put on behavior that's going to represent Him. I have the mind of Christ. I have the Spirit of God in me. I don't have the privilege or the right, which is not really a privilege, to go out and just act like everybody else. And my real purpose in being here is not to please myself, it's to represent God and draw other people to Him through my godly behavior. 
you know, before I actually physically get out of bed, I just take that moment to remember. And one of my favorite verses for the morning is Psalm 143, verse 8. And it says, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I've placed my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. And then I simply say, good morning, Lord. I don't know where you're going, but wherever you're going, I'm coming with you. It's just a way of acknowledging, Lord, my steps are ordered by you. So today I want to gladly walk close to you in the steps that you have ordered. But if you really believe that God is good and has your best interest at heart, even when it doesn't go according to your wishes, you can trust that a loving Father in heaven is doing what's good and best. And in the end, though it may not make sense this side of heaven, what I know in part, then I will know fully, even as I'm fully known. So one day the things that don't necessarily make sense now, we'll be able to understand then. In the meantime, I have to just trust I have a good and loving Father who has my best interest at heart. God wants you to enjoy every single day. And we should enjoy getting up in the morning, enjoy going to work, enjoy our family, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy every part of our day. That's God's dream. But I know too many people that are just dragging through life. They don't like their job. They can't stand the traffic. They don't enjoy their spouse. They're just going through the motions of life, getting up, going to work, coming home. No joy, no enthusiasm. But friends, it doesn't bring any glory to God for us to drag around with a long face, negative, discouraged, tired, worn out. We need to get up every morning and say with David, this is the day the Lord has made and I am going to enjoy it. We need to make that declaration right at the start of the day. David was saying in effect, I'm not gonna focus on what's wrong today. I'm gonna focus on what's right. I'm not gonna dwell on what I don't have. I'm gonna thank God for what I do have. You can enjoy every day of your life if you want to badly enough. Trouble in life is inevitable. Uh, bad chapters in life are inevitable. Bad scenes in the story of your life are inevitable. But misery is a choice. Misery is an option. It's your choice. It's not mandatory. It's not required. And I want to encourage you. Misery and unhappiness are not required. Misery and, un and unhappiness are a choice. And we can make the choice today to live miserably through our life story, or we can live with joy through our life story. We can live in misery, or we can live in joy. And we can be happy, and it's a choice. No one has the power to make you unhappy. No one has the power to control your life. We only give people the power over our lives by the choices we make to wait for them to make us happy. Or we can choose to be happy because God is with us through our toughest times, through our toughest trials, and through our life story. You may have a problem today. You may be facing difficulties, but you've got to learn to turn that situation over to God. Quit worrying about it. He is in control and He's promised if you will keep your trust in Him, no matter what comes against you, He will turn it around and use it to your advantage. And some of you need to shake yourself out of that old negative, defeated mentality. Quit dreading going to work tomorrow. Quit being depressed because you haven't gotten married yet. Quit getting all upset because your plans didn't work out. Focus on what you have, not what you don't have. I heard somebody say, give this day your very best because there may not be a tomorrow. In other words, change your attitude. Put a smile on your face. Oh, Joel, that's easy for you. You smile all the time. You're always happy. No, listen, I get up each morning just like you, and a lot of times I don't feel like being in a good mood. I don't feel like smiling. When I get out of bed, I make a choice. I say, Joel, you can either go through this day happy, enjoy it with a positive outlook, or you can go around negative and sour, focused on your problems. And one thing I'm very good at is I choose to be happy. I choose at the very start to enjoy that day. I had to really learn how to enjoy life on purpose. See, if you experience a lot of guilt and condemnation, you're not enjoying life. If you don't like yourself, you're not enjoying life. If you got a guilty conscience all the time, you're not enjoying life. So keep in mind, I'm not talking about a party, a vacation, payday, a new outfit, I'm talking about can you enjoy plain old ordinary Monday?
when you got to do the laundry and go to the grocery store and clean up the mess from the weekend, can you get up on Tuesday then and do it again? And on Wednesday and do it again? I'm talking about doing ordinary everyday life with a calm delight and a smile on your face because you know who you belong to and you know that it, in the end what's going to happen. Yes. So John 10:10 10, 10 means a lot to me. It says the thief comes only in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief is the devil. <laughs> but Jesus said, I came. Thank God. What a royal interruption. <laughs> Don't you love that? This is what the devil is doing, but Jesus said, hold it. I came. I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Wait a minute. God, in all of his holiness, says, I want you to enjoy your life, and I want you to enjoy it in abundance to the full until it's running out of you. You know why? Because then it's liable to get all over somebody else around you. If the devil cannot keep us sad and mad, then he loses the battle. I said, if the devil cannot keep us sad and mad, he loses the battle. The devil don't want your stuff, he wants your joy. Why? Because joy is strength. The happier you are, the stronger you are. Don't let the enemy steal your joy. If he can't get your joy, he can't get your strength. When you have joy, you are strong. When you have joy, you can fight the good fight of faith. And some of you today, you need to draw the line in the sand and say, enough is enough. I choose to enjoy my life while God is in the process of working things out. And really, that's the key. You may be in a difficult situation today in your marriage, or your health, your finances, but don't make the mistake of waiting for everything to get better before you decide to start enjoying your life. Your attitude should be, this is where God has me right now, and I'm going to be happy in spite of what's come against me. Stop waiting for your life to start. So many times we are waiting for something to happen before we are ready to live. We're waiting to have the right job before we start living. We're waiting for the right spouse before we start living. We're waiting to be married before we start living. We're waiting to be divorced before we start living. We're waiting to have our first child before we start living. We're waiting to graduate from college or graduate from a, a, an advanced degree before we start living. But we have to stop. We have to stop all that. We have to stop waiting to start living. We have to start living now. Stop waiting for your life to start. Stop waiting for your life to start. Stop waiting before you can start enjoying your life or enjoying the scenes of life or enjoying the beauty that God has created around you. You don't have to wait till the end of the story to live happily ever after. You can live happily ever now. You can live happily ever now, beginning today. It's a choice. It's a choice. Remember, trouble is inevitable. Misery is a choice. Misery is a decision. Misery is an option. And I'm opting out of misery. How about you? We have to understand every day is a gift from God. We're not always going to be here. The scripture says our lives are like a mist. We're here for a moment and then we're gone. And every day that we live negative and discouraged and depressed, that's a day that we've wasted. And we should live every day like it could be our last. We should get up every morning with a grateful attitude. As I said, instead of complaining about going to work, be thankful that you have a job. Instead of complaining about, oh, I got to clean up after these kids, let's be thankful that God has blessed us with our children. Let me put it to you this way. How different would you live this week if all of a sudden you discovered this was going to be your last week? How many times would you get upset and frustrated? How long would you stay offended if you knew you only had a week or two to live? No, I'm challenging you to make the most of this day. Live it like it could be your last. Don't go around negative and discouraged. 
Don't go around with bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. Don't allow little things to steal your joy. Life is way too short for that. Take time to enjoy this day. God created us to enjoy life, to enjoy the world in which we live. For instance, if you look down through these verses, you will discover all of these principles of enjoying life. First of all, in verses 7 and 8, we are told to experience every day totally. He says, truly, the light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. What Solomon is saying is we don't know how long we have to live, so we should enjoy every day with everything that we have. Here is the message and its paraphrase of these verses. Oh, how sweet the light of day and how wonderful to live in the sunshine. Even if you live a long time, don't take a single day for granted. Take delight in each light-filled hour, remembering that there will be many dark days and that most of what your comes your way is smoke. Solomon is saying, God wants you to enjoy every day. How wonderful it is to enjoy every day. When I came back from cancer several years ago, my oncologist told me, when you go back to San Diego, Dr. Jeremiah, the sun's going to be brighter, the sea's going to be bluer, the grass is going to be greener than it's ever been in your whole life. I did not understand what he meant until I came home. And I realized how easy it is for us to take for granted the beauty that God has created around us and the joy of waking up every day to this beautiful world in which we live. When you realize you do not have a lot of time to enjoy life, you figure out how to enjoy life. And Solomon is saying, don't wait until then. You know, get up every day and look out in the world in which you live and say, thank you, Lord, for this new day. Thank you for light. Thank you for air to breathe. Experience every day totally. When you live in uncertainty, that's how you live. Every day is a gift and you enjoy it. Life is too short to go through it dreading things and not enjoying your family and being upset because you didn't get your way. No, make the most of this day. You can never get it back. Times may be tough, but don't use that as an excuse to live your life sour. God is in control. You need to get up every morning and say with David, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to be happy. And if you will stay full of joy, you'll not only bring glory to God, but you will feel better, you'll be healthier, and you'll live longer. So I challenge you again, enjoy every day. Don't focus on the negative. Don't dread things. Choose to be happy. I cannot think of anything worse after all God's done for us than to go through life and not really enjoy it. And yet that's what so many people are doing today. Why don't you make a decision with me that from now on you're going to enjoy everything you do from sun up to sundown. You're going to bring God glory by being happy and having a good attitude wherever you are. Thanksgiving is not just a response of thanks when something goes your way or you're granted a favor. You see, true Thanksgiving is not an outside formality. It's an inside reality. It's your default. True Thanksgiving is a default. And it's not something done for you. It's something done inside of you. When the alarm clock rings tomorrow morning, what's your attitude? I've made it a point on purpose every time I hear the alarm clock to thank God. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. Say that with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be made glad in it. Only a fraction of the human population ever truly thanks God personally. Only a fraction of the human population ever truly lives a life of gratitude. Uh, it's so easy to start with a complaining attitude. It's so easy to roll out of bed and start seeing the glasses half empty. What isn't that should be? What's lost that should, that I should have? And so on and so on. And it's just a pattern of thinking. Thankfulness is a decision. Am I choosing thankfulness over complaining moment by moment? We all woke up today. 
But how many of us thanked God for it? Let's take an assessment of our prayer life for a second. What percentage of my prayers are complaints? How much of my time speaking to God is offering thanksgiving out of a heart of gratitude or complaining out of a heart of bitterness and insecurity? We should be grateful to Jesus for everything. When, when we start off each day complaining, because here's the thing about complaining, complaining lacks almost always lacks perspective. What we are missing in the midst of our negative attitude and our complaining and whining is perspective. Instead of focusing on the goodness and the grace of God in our lives, we get fixated on what we, what we don't have, on what someone else has instead of us. And we can lose perspective. And we just forget about how we've been blessed. God, you know, forgive me for the days I've not been grateful. If you don't understand this principle, prayer can turn into a complaining session where we just air out all our worries, tell God everything that's wrong and how bad life is and God, I can't take this anymore. It's a whole different perspective to say, God, I have all these things coming against me, but I wanna thank you that you are fighting my battles. Thank you that you hold victory in store for the upright. Thank you that what's meant for my harm, you are turning to my advantage. You know, if we're honest, it's easier to complain than it is to worship and be thankful, isn't it? Like if we're honest in here, every one of us, can we be honest, we really like complaining. I love complaining. Why? Because it puts the problem on somebody else, not me. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how much I might have caused the problem. When I complain, all of a sudden it's not my problem, it's someone else's problem. And no one really likes to hear others complain, do we? And yet we all love to complain, especially when we go through difficult circumstances, especially when life doesn't look the way that we think it should look or things don't turn out the way that we think they should. Our initial instinct is to complain, not give thanks. Understand this, complaining is the default. Gratitude is a choice. And even when things look the way they are, you can still choose thankfulness. You can still choose gratitude. You can still choose worship. Gratitude is a constant mindset of thankfulness. It's more than just saying thank you every once in a while to God or to people. It's an attitude of gratitude that you make as your lifestyle. You see, true thanksgiving is when there's more to complain about, but we choose to look for what we can be thankful for. A few years ago, I was in a car with a man who was very successful and very rich. He had everything you could ever think of. He was the envy of all of his business partners. But the more we spoke about stuff going on on the inside, he began to weep. He confessed that although on the outside everything seemed great, he was miserable on the inside. Wealth and success had not been able to fill the empty places in his heart. But then on another occasion, I visited another man as we, and we sat with his family of five and they lived in a, hum, in a humble little country setting. His house was small and he almost had nothing in the way of worldly possessions. Yet his face was radiant as he told me about his church and his involvement and, and how God had filled their lives with joy and gladness. <laughs> and when it was all done, I was convinced that the second man was really the successful and rich man. The second man was the one that had the greatest wealth. Although he didn't have much of, in the way of possessions, he had learned to be truly thankful for everything God had given to him. Paul the Apostle declared, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Spirit of thankfulness makes all the difference, don't you think? Here's a question. Are you constantly preoccupied with what you do not have? Or have you learned to thank God for what you do have? 
The Bible commands us give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, I don't know what trials you may be facing right now, but God does, and He loves you, and He is with you. Cultivate a spirit of true thankfulness. Even in the midst of trials, before God rewards, before God heals, in the midst of the headaches, before God brings wholeness, be thankful. We can be thankful for a lot of stuff in the midst of affliction, can't we? Then remember, every day can be a day of thanksgiving. Don't let a day go by without thanking God for His mercy and His grace to us in Christ Jesus. When we wake up in the morning, you know what I say? I sit up and go, Jesus, thank you. I'm alive. I woke up alive. I have one more day to praise you. Think about what we think about the things that God provides for you that cost you nothing. When you get up in the morning tomorrow, go find something to be gra grateful for and thank Jesus for it. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he says this. He says, it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. I take time every morning to start the day off in faith, pray and read my Bible. But 90% of my prayer time is thanking God for what He's done and thanking Him for what He's promised. Father, thank You that I'm blessed. Thank You that You've crowned me with favor. Thank You that I'm anointed. Thank You that my children are mighty in the land. Thank You that Your angels watch after us. Lord, I thank You that You're still in control. I thank you that your mercy is bigger than my mistakes, that you're the God of another chance, that your purpose for my life can still come to pass. Do we, do we pause to give him thanks for all of those things? Or do our worries and concerns, the, the waves and the storm overshadow the, the items that we can be grateful for? Every single day. So here's, here's some application if you're interested. Every day of my life, I wake up and I write down five things I'm thankful for. Five things I'm thankful for. It has been one of the greatest gifts to me. Just to start my day in the direction of gratitude and reflecting on God's goodness, it has been a tremendous gift. And any one of you can do it. Like you take, the, like I, it's not proprietary, take that and steal it. I just got a journal. I mean, it, I just, I have a journal. I open it up, I write five things down. And I can look back and like see things I don't even remember writing down. Like, oh yeah, God is faithful. God is faithful. He is trustworthy. I would challenge you to do this for the next week. Just every day, write down three things that you are specifically grateful for. Take a few minutes every morning, write down three things you are specifically grateful for. Be grateful in any and every circumstance. And when we do that, it just it changes so much of how we see the world. It changes us. I think you'd agree with me that it's, isn't it so easy to allow a spirit of ingratitude to harden our hearts until a a sense of entitlement pervades us. And instead of being thankful, we think we're owed what we got. And we actually should have more. <laughs> but from one end of the Bible to the other, we're commanded to be thankful in whatever circumstances we're in. If we don't learn and practice true thanksgiving now when there's nothing there, then when God gives you more, you'll still be dissatisfied. It's not the amount of possessions, it's the amount of heart within those possessions, whether it's big or small. Thanksgiving, giving thanks, is an act of worship to God. This is something we're to do when life is hard, when difficulty strikes, when chaos is all around us. We are still called to worship with thankfulness the God who created us. For true thanksgiving is only found in the midst of true adversity, regardless of the circumstances. This should be one of the most distinctive marks of a believer of Jesus Christ. Before we see favor, before we see advantage, before we see our prayers answered, 30 times in the book of Psalms, we're instructed to give thanks, 
not due to any favorable circumstance, but in the midst of dire straits. You see, true thanksgiving is recognizing the safekeeping of God in times of adversity. Thanksgiving is part of the most intimate relationship between God and man. But let me encourage you that true thanksgiving does not start after something good happens. See, sometimes we wait for the conclusion, we wait for the result, and then we say thank you. True thanksgiving happens when, regardless of the circumstance, I have a predisposition of thankfulness because God is still in control no matter what. The whole key is you can't wait for it to change, then you're gonna thank Him. You have to thank Him in advance. That's your faith being released. Look back over your life. There's not a time that God has failed you. May not have been easy, but He made a way. He sustained you through the loss. He had mercy on your mistakes. He opened doors you couldn't open. He brought awesome people into your life. Why are you doubting Him now? Why are you worrying your prayers? Start adding thanksgiving to your request. Thank God in the midst of the challenge for what He's about to do. Hey, this is the greatest day of your life. Well, how can you say that, Rick? Well, because it's the only day you've got. Yesterday's gone forever, and you can't guarantee you're gonna be here tomorrow. What is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a moment, and it's gone. Boast not of tomorrow, for you don't know what a day may bring forth. So every day the sun comes up, you need to try to find something good about that day, because your life is lived one 24-hour span at a time. Today, look around. Surely there are small blessings, little joys, tiny hints of God's favor for which you can be grateful. Don't take things for granted today. Take them with gratitude. When you wake up in the morning, you can feel gloom, despair, nothing good in your future. There will always be opportunities to be discouraged, offended, upset, but you have to make the choice that's not for me. I'm going to live this day in faith. I'm going to focus on what's right. I want to enjoy my family. I'm going to be grateful. I'm choosing to have a good mood. When you get your mind going in the right direction, filled with thoughts of faith, hope, and victory, you'll drive away the blahs, the discouragement, the discontentment. Instead of dwelling on what you don't have, what's wrong, what didn't work out, start thinking about what God promised you. Father, you said my latter days will be better than my former days. You said I haven't seen, heard, or imagined what you have in store. The mistake we make is we let feelings determine our mood. We wake up and think, how do I feel today? If we feel the blahs, then we go around discouraged. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to deal with these children. I have so many problems. Right there, you have a choice. Are you going to let those feelings dictate your mood? Or are you going to rule over those feelings and decide what kind of mood you're going to be in? You have to be proactive. Father, thank you that this is going to be a great day. I know I'm surrounded by your favor. Goodness and mercy are following me. You said you hold victory in store for the upright. Don't wait for the feelings to come. Get your mind filled with the right thoughts, and the feelings will eventually follow your thoughts. This is what David did. He had all kinds of trouble, armies coming against him, people slandering him. His own son was trying to take the throne. You can imagine how strong those negative feelings were, discouragement, anger, self-pity. When everything said, be depressed, be sour, he woke up in the morning and said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Each day that God gives us is a gift. I want to emphasize that. Each day that God gives us is a gift. David said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. You know, I don't want to waste a day in self-pity and anger and sitting around feeling sorry for myself. And I don't know, but maybe when David said, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad. Maybe he wasn't having such a good day and he wasn't feeling like being jolly, but he was making a decision. I'm not going to waste this day. 
I will rejoice and be glad. So maybe right now, maybe this is a day for you where you have a problem. Something has happened that you certainly didn't want to happen. One of your kids has done something that now you're gonna have to deal with or you've had another kind of challenge, a test, a tribulation, and you have a choice to either let it make you miserable or to seize the day and say, no, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. Now, come on, just think about it. How many days have you lost and wasted in self-pity, in anger, in reasoning, trying to figure out some situation in your life that you're never gonna figure out because only God knows the answer? We don't wanna keep wasting our days. Each day is valuable and we need to make each one of them count. You have to say to discouragement, I will rejoice. Say to self-pity, I will be glad today. Say to sadness, the loss, to no passion, you're not gonna control my life. I may feel you, but you're not telling me the truth. You don't dictate my future. I will live this day in faith. I will rejoice. I will be glad in it. God wants you to live with joy. Do you believe that? Like contrary to popular opinion, God doesn't want your life to be full of stress, worry, and anxiety. God doesn't want you to feel like you're about to collapse under the weight of your circumstance. No, God's plan for you is joy in every season of your life. The Old Testament prophet Nehemiah, he said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's what fortifies us. It's what holds us when it feels like the world is caving in, when the weight of the world is on our shoulders. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. God wants to see us filled with his joy. The scripture says joy comes in the morning. Every morning, joy is waiting for you. But let me tell you what else comes in the morning. Guilt, look at the mistakes you've made. Bitterness, boy, they did you wrong. Discouragement, nothing good is in your future. Self-pity, why were you raised like that? God sends joy every morning just for you but the enemy sends all these other things. Now you get to choose. And here's the key. The negative is easier. Living off the surface, just going by what you feel, letting that dictate your day, that doesn't take any effort. But if you're going to live a victorious life, if you're going to reach your full potential, you have to go deeper and not be ruled by your emotions, not let feelings dictate your day. You have to choose to have a good mood despite the feelings. Choose joy despite the discouragement. Choose faith despite the doubt. So start your day with God. I love this poem by Ralph Spaulding Cushman. It says this, I met God in the morning when my day was at its best and his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. All day long the presence lingered. All day long he stayed with me. And we sailed in perfect calmness o'er a very troubled sea. Other ships were blown and battered. Other ships were sore distressed. But the winds that seemed to drive them brought to us a peace and rest. Then I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of mind when I too had loosed the moorings with the presence left behind. So I think I know the secret. Learn from many a troubled way you must seek him in the morning if you want him through the day. Seek God first. Start your day with God. What does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall clothe yourself with, all your needs, all these things that you need will be added to you. He will take care of that if you put him first. And then Take life one day at a time. When you lie in the bed in the morning, you can dwell on the negative, everything that's wrong. You're going to draw in more negative, more discouragement. Or in the face of those feelings, you can start thinking faith-filled thoughts, positive, hopeful, uplifting. That's what you're going to draw in. And it's important to start the day off in faith. This is when the enemy works overtime to try to give you the blahs. Instead of letting him set the tone, why don't you set the tone? 
Before you get out of bed, you need to decide it's going to be a good day and you're going to live it in faith. And sure, you may have challenges, but God is on the throne. He's fighting your battles. While he's working, instead of being discouraged, worried, in a bad mood, why don't you enjoy your life? I'm not asking you to deny what you feel. I'm asking you to add the yet. I had a bad break, yet will I rejoice. My child is off course, I should be depressed, yet I'm hopeful knowing God has the final say. These people at work aren't treating me right. My feelings are telling me to get bitter, to be angry, to pay them back but I know God is my vindicator, so yet will I rejoice. Yet will I have a smile. Yet will I be good to people. The psalmist said, a good person may fall seven times, but the Lord will raise them up. Sometimes you can't get up on your own, but God is right there with you, lifting you, strengthening you, healing you, breathing in your direction. Every morning, start the day off in faith. Father, thank you that this is going to be a great day. God, I'm grateful that I'm alive. Thank you that you chose me before I could choose you. Thank you for my family. Thank you for good health. Thank you for opportunity. Thank you for surrounding me with your favor. Lord, I'm going to live this day to the full.